we are going to demonstrate how to do a proximal and a distal paravertebral nerve block. A few things just to sort of introduce the subject. Paravertebral nerve blocks are what we refer to as regional blocks in cattle. And basically by regional block, what I mean is that we are targeting specific nerves to anesthetize a larger area on the cow. This should be differentiated from local blocks, where a local block is right where you're going to do surgery or right where you're going to cut the cow is where you're going to inject the lidocaine. With a regional block, we are achieving, or with the paravertebral nerve blocks, I should say, we are achieving anesthesia of the paralumbar fossa by targeting three specific nerves. And those nerves are going to be the last thoracic nerve, or T13, the first lumbar nerve, L1, and the second lumbar nerve, L2. So T13, L1, and L2. Sometimes, if you have to go really far caudal and really far ventral in the paralumbar fossa, say for a large C-section, we may block T13, L1, L2, and L3. The surgeries that we do in cattle in the paralumbar fossa is basically just about any abdominal surgery you can think of. So DA correction, exploratory laparotomy, C-section, these are all done in the paralumbar fossa and typically done with the animal standing. So it's really advantageous for us to have some type of anesthetic procedure that we can anesthetize these nerves without putting these animals under general anesthesia. And the paravertebral nerve block is exactly what we're looking for. The other advantage of a regional block over, say, just a local block is that, first of all, it uses less lidocaine, so it's more economical. Secondly, I think it's a huge advantage to not be injecting lidocaine right where you're going to make your incision. If you inject a bunch of lidocaine right where you're going to make your incision, the skin or the, and the tissue, the body wall becomes really, really endemitous because you're injecting fluid within those tissues. It makes the tissues more friable. It makes them less easy to handle, less easy to suture up. And there actually is some evidence that lidocaine actually decreases wound healing, which is obviously a disadvantage when you want the surgical procedure to heal. The other advantage of a regional block is it gives you versatility in where you place your incision. If we block a small little area with a local block, and then we get into surgery and realize that we want to extend our incision, or we want to change the direction of our incision, or perhaps after we get scrubbed into our surgery, we forget exactly where we put that local anesthetic, and we decide to, to move the incision, now we need to, to re-block that animal. Whereas with a regional block, we know that this entire paralumbar fossa is blocked. So the landmarks for the paralumbar fossa, it's basically bounded by the lateral aspect of these transverse processes, the lumbar vertebrae, the last rib as it courses down over the side of the flank, and the flank fold which starts at the tuber coxae and runs down the uh, basically the angle of the internal abdominal oblique as it courses down to the ventral parts of these ribs. So now we're going to talk about how we actually identify the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae. Cattle have six lumbar vertebrae. However, the first lumbar vertebrae that you can readily palpate is usually going to be L5. The first thing that you want to identify on this cow is the tuber coxae. And regardless of your bovine experience, everyone should be able to identify the tuber coxae. That's the big point of the hip. So we identify tuber coxae. The first transverse process that we feel in front of the tuber coxae in most cows, unless you have a really skinny emaciated cow, is usually going to be L5. L4, L3, L2, and L1. The equipment that we need for these techniques I've laid out here in front of us. First of all, for the proximal paravertebral nerve block, we need an 18 gauge 6 inch spinal needle and a 14 gauge 1 inch needle that we are going to use as a cannula. It just so happens that the 18 gauge needle will telescope inside the 14 gauge needle. For the distal paravertebral nerve block, we need an inch and a half, 18 gauge needle. And for both of these nerve blocks, 
we need a syringe that we will use for injection of the local anesthetic. For the proximal paravertebral nerve block, we need to keep two things in mind. First of all, these transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae do not emerge from the spine in a straight rectangular manner. Instead, they curve somewhat cranially, such that if you go off the cranial aspect of, say, L1, and you follow that straight up to midline, that's going to put you near the base of the caudal aspect of T13. If you go off the cranial aspect of L2, and you follow that straight up to midline, that's going to put you near the base of the caudal aspect of L1. And if you go off the cranial aspect of L3 and you follow that up to midline, that's going to put you near the base of the caudal aspect of L2. The second thing to keep in mind are these nerves represented by pipe cleaners on the skeleton. The nerves run just caudal to the transverse processes that they're named after. And that is how we are going to find nerves T13, L1, and L2. We need to use a 6-inch, 18-gauge needle. As you can see on the skeleton, that we need to get down probably at least 3 or 4 inches before we actually reach the level of this nerve. Since this is an 18 gauge and such a long needle, it's pretty flimsy. If we try to get this through thick cowhide, it's likely going to bend. So to achieve that, we're going to use a 14 gauge, 1 inch needle. This is going to be used as a cannula to just get through the thick skin. And then once this is through the skin, it won't come anywhere near the, the nerve. But once this is through the skin, the 18 gauge needle will then go through the cannula and we're going to go down and we're going to try to find the bone that's associated with the nerve that we're trying to block. We're going to need to actually put a good bit of force on this needle to drive it through the, the skin. So we don't want to hold it like this because as we would go to drive this into the cow, it's likely going to just slip out of our fingers. So the way that I hold it is that I hold this needle in my sort of in that knuckle right there, I kind of wrap it around that uh, the hub of the needle, and you'll see the way that this needle is directed. Forces coming back up this needle are actually counteracted by that fleshy part of my finger. It's not capitalizing on any strength of my grip itself. Now you could say that as you look at that needle, that's not a very secure way to hold that. And you would be correct. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wrap my thumb right around that, which actually holds that tight into my hand. So it's pretty important that when you hold this cannula, that you hold it in a way that the tip of that needle comes out in a perpendicular direction to the long axis of your arm. This allows you, when you penetrate the cow, to actually lead with the tip of the needle. If that needle comes out at an angle, then, when you go to drive this in the cow, oftentimes your palm hits the cow before the needle actually penetrates. The other thing that may happen is that that will just continue to fold up as you drive this needle in. That needle continues to fold up under your hand and not actually penetrate through the skin of the cow. We remember that the nerve runs directly caudal to the transverse process that carries the same name. And so what we're going to do is we're going to walk right off the back side of that bone to block that nerve. Now, what we have to realize is that needle is down in several inches and we just can't slide off the back of the bone because it's going to bend our needle. We're going to need to pull that needle up into the cannula, redirect caudal, and back down. If we're still hitting bone, that's fine. We're going to pull back up, redirect caudal, and back down. And we're going to do this until we walk off the back of that bone. 
So how deep does that nerve actually run? Well, the nerve runs about a centimeter below the level of these transverse processes. So what we would like to establish when the first time that we actually hit that transverse process is we would actually like to establish the depth of that needle. How I do that is with my thumb and forefinger, I hold the hub of the needle. With my little finger, I mark that spinal needle up about a centimeter above the level of that cannula. Up, redirect caudal, back down, still bone. Up, redirect caudal, bam. I've walked off the back of the bone. My little finger has gone all the way down to the cannula. Three things should happen. First of all, your little finger should go all the way down. Secondly, there's a tight fascial plane that runs in between all these transverse processes. So usually in that area, you'll feel a bit of a pop. And thirdly, we're at the nerve, and so hopefully she gives us a little bit of a reaction, a little sign that we're actually on the nerve that we intend to block. So with the proximal paravertebral nerve block, we're blocking T13, L1, and L2 immediately as they emerge from the intervertebral foramen of these vertebral bodies. With the distal paravertebral nerve block, we are blocking nerves T13, L1, and L2 at the lateral aspect of the transverse processes, L1, L2, and L4, respectively. Another thing that you need to keep in mind with the distal paravertebral nerve block is there's actually two nerves. There's only one represented here with each of these pipe cleaners, but there's actually two nerves, at least by the time they reach the lateral aspect of these transverse processes. They emerge from the same intervertebral foramen. So when we do the proximal paravertebral nerve block, we are blocking both nerves at one location. However, distally, we have a nerve that runs on the top of each of these transverse processes, and we have a nerve that runs on the ventral aspect of each of these transverse processes. So, with the distal paravertebral nerve block, we are going to take our 18 gauge, inch and a half needle. We are going to go in, hit the transverse process of, for example, L1. We're going to go above the transverse process. We're going to fan out and inject about 15 cc's of lidocaine. We're going to pull back out. We're going to feel that transverse process. We're going to angle below and inject 20 cc's of lidocaine below. There's three ways that we're going to check to see if our paravertebral nerve block works. First of all, the cow will develop some scoliosis to the, to the back because these muscles are relaxed and these muscles over on this side are still tense, still tight. This side's going to develop a convex appearance where the other side is going to develop a concave uh, contour to them. And when you look down from the back, you will see that the spine is curved, and that's what we call scoliosis. Secondly, because these muscles are relaxed, the vessels within those muscles tend to dilate. They carry more blood flow, and because of that, this side is gonna feel warmer compared to, the, compared to the other side, or the paralumbar fossa is gonna feel warmer compared to other areas on this cap. The gold standard method, and the third way that we check and see if they're blocked, is pain sensation. Obviously, if she's scoliose and she feels warm, but she still responds to pain, that's not going to be sufficient, and we're going to need to either touch up her block, repeat her block, or, or do something different. To, sense, to, to detect pain sensation, I usually take one of the needles that I've used to block, and I'm going to poke them in the paralumbar fossa. And I'm going to poke them actually hard enough that I actually see blood coming before I actually cut this animal. Because I would much rather them tell me that she's not blocked now than when I actually get into surgery and then I have an incision halfway open and she's kicking and potentially contaminating her incision or doing something worse. So anyway, those are the three methods, pain, scoliosis, and heat that we're going to use to determine whether our block was successful.